Hello, I'm Michael Forrester. I'm reading to you today from Forest Rain, my first book of essays, metaphorical fiction and poetry. And this piece is called The Biker. I draw out to the traffic lights in the outside lane in order to turn right. I'm away in trance, thinking about nothing in particular, when I become aware of a motorcycle pulling up behind. He's woven his way through the traffic, but I've not left enough room between my car and the vehicle in the next lane to enable him to pass through. So I sit, waiting for the lights to change, half listening to the throb coming from behind me. The silencer on the bike has been removed to turn up the volume. He revs the throttle impatiently, drawing an aggressive throaty growl from the engine that stands as the oratory of his impatience. His irritation is clearly growing. He's becoming angry at my having impeded his progress to the front of the traffic queue. Is he a hell's angel? Will he get off the bike and approach me? Will his anger boil over? Is road rage to follow? Will I be hauled unceremoniously from my car and thrown to the ground as he vents his frustration? And then I stop myself. I begin to reconsider all the value judgments we make as we pass through each day, our attention focused on ourselves. Will that woman be verbally aggressive to me? Is that man a threat to me? Is that child going to cross my path and trip me up? Does this situation offer an opportunity for me to bolster my opinion of myself? Will that one diminish me in your eyes? Will this conflict harm me? How can I protect myself? How can I best make you esteem me? We ride a veritable merry-go-round of self-focused fear, revolving at the breakneck speed of unconscious thought, so ingrained in us that we are largely unaware of what is happening at all. Without realising what we're doing, we assess everything and everyone from the perspective of our own self-interest, unless we have become aware of that pattern, and unless our love has become unconditional. We throw up a force field of self-protective tension about ourselves that we allow no one to penetrate until we are sure they are no threat. We isolate ourselves emotionally through fear. We touch in body, but not in mind or heart. We seek to build ourselves up in the eyes of others, that we might seek more than we believe we really are. For we have learned to think of others as bigger, more attractive, more valuable than ourselves. The images that we hold of others have been larger than reality since childhood. The pain of young competition has taught us until we have fused the lesson into our neurology that we must presume the universe to be a dangerous place, that other people must be assumed to be a danger until we have enough of experience of them to know that we are safe. So we in turn learn to project an image of ourselves that is stronger, more capable, more articulate, more attractive, more admirable, more lovable than we really believe ourselves to be. Because we do not see ourselves as we are, as love has made us, we need to bolster our wizened images of our identity in the forlorn hope that others will perceive us to be more than we fear ourselves to be. For only then can we believe that they will think that we match up to the fantasy image of their innate superiority that we carry around inside ourselves. Only then will we be safe. Only then will we be lovable. Only then are we enough. Of course, the problem is that everyone else is doing the same thing as well. 
So here we go, to and fro upon the earth, preoccupying our days with the projecting of vainglorious images that are intended to match the mirages we are receiving back, each of us holding a magnifying glass to our identity, each pretending to measure up to some unnecessary and unachievable standard we call superiority in a spiral of fictional frenzy that becomes ever more intense and ever less satisfying. We choose the battlegrounds of identity enhancement to suit what we perceive to be our natural advantages. Physical characteristics of beauty or strength, intellectual capabilities of the mind, strength of personality that yields power and control, gifts and talents or the ubiquitous catch-all of material possession. Never have the Joneses been more kept up with. Eventually, though, we arrive at the place where we have fought enough conflicts, reckoning our level relative to others with the unbalanced theodolites of perceived superiority. The battleground itself then comes to stand in our mind, as the representation of the identities we seek to bolster, and the trance is complete. I don't mind that I'm less competent than you at, say, deep-sea diving or interior design, for it holds no meaning for me. But challenge my perception of myself as, say, an outstanding apple picker, and I'll react in anger. For I've come to hold apple picking, or whatever it happens to be, as the centre of my universe. It's a metaphor for who I am. We go through the whole of our lives like this, if we choose, living by the values of the child, perceiving ourselves as weak, unregarded or unlovable. And we can waste lifetime after lifetime if we do not transcend the fears of the child that we carry inside. But if we're fortunate, eventually we come to see the strategy for what it is. It generally takes an epiphany of a life crisis before we learn to recognise our self-manipulation. Then it is that at last we learn to take the energy we've applied to making ourselves feel safe and instead send it out to other hearts and souls around us in an exploration driven by loving curiosity. We begin to touch the universe as it is for the first time in our lives and find it to be different from the self-protective trances in which we have slept for so long. We learn that others are touchable, that they have hearts and souls, joys, pains, strengths and weaknesses, hopes and fears, just as we do. And when we touch another, who responds with aggression. It no longer forces us back into a protective shell, but the former view of the universe reconfirmed for a negative eternity. For we realise that here is a soul who has simply yet to learn the way the universe is, to realise that body is made of energy and the soul was made to love unconditionally. Then it is, all those fatuous crutches, emotional, intellectual, physical, material, that we used to need now seem somehow import unimportant. We bury them at sea without sadness or remorse. We watch them slip slowly away from under the ensign of our identity. I do not need to impress you anymore. I don't need to fear you anymore. For your heart is as my heart. Your soul is here on a contract, a life contract, just as is mine. You are my brother, my sister, my father, my mother. Loving you is as natural as loving myself. The fog of trance is burned away in the unremitting midday sunlight 
of higher truth revealed. The battlegrounds matter no longer, for we ourselves no longer feel the need to be bigger than the other person. We are content to be as we are. And in so being, we've started on the road to self-realisation and growth of the soul. We have perhaps at last begun the learning that we needed to imbibe for this lifetime. So let's go back to that biker revving his engine behind me in the traffic here. Has he cloaked himself with images of power? Or have I wound him in swaddling clothes of my own unresolved childhood fear? Who creates the barrier between the biker and me? Is it his unconscious acts of self-enhancement or my nightmare monsters loosed from the bowels of my dream world? Or is it perhaps no more than a car window and 20 feet of empty air? The lights change and the motorcyclist slips through the gap that was always there between the car in the next lane and mine. He roars away to his day's work as a nursery school teacher, a spiritual healer, civil servant in an office. I make my right turn, catch a familiar face and wave. The trance is over. I've reached beyond my self-protective cell and touched another's reality. In this lifetime, he will never know he has enhanced me. You can check out Forest Drain further at the link attached to this video. I'm Michael Forrester. Thanks for listening.